Now, the views and opinions expressed during RealBlackClock.com do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management. I understand that, but you can change it again. So I'm just asking. You can change it again, but it's, it's very hard to say yes or, or no. The city council, I myself, we've talked about this many times. Should we have, we've even looked at models. In, in some cities, you have the same kind of uh, election process, but the mayor is elected out of it by the people. So it's a discussion that we really have had on several occasions. And I really in fact, I was going to ask the knows or the don't know, and you could have said it then. But so I, let me just ask if you, if you feel this isn't something that should be considered, and Denise has expressed that. Just a raise of hand, a raise of hands. You're, you're asking two questions at the same time. Okay. The question now is how many wants to change the system. So right. Those who want to change the system, raise your hand. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> those who want to change the system, feel the system would function better, as we heard, raise, raise your hand. hand. Okay, those who feel that the system works just... ...really having the voice of the community and of the residents of the different neighborhoods heard uh, in the process of taking a decision. Uh, and the main reason is because of the architecture uh, of the form of government that is Plan E. And so what we have is that we have a, a CEO, which is the city manager. We have a board of director, which is uh, consists of uh, nine members, nine individuals. And those are the people that we elect and they form the city council. And among themselves, they elect a chairman of the board. And the chairman of the board becomes the official representative uh, of the city of Cambridge, the mayor. The city councillors make $80,000 a year, the city mayor makes $116,000, and the city manager makes $330,000 plus full benefits, all of the position. Since we have a CEO that takes care of operations uh, on a daily basis, the city, uh, city councillors and the city mayor are part-time position. Yes, you have heard me well, they are part-time uh, position. The uh, city council can appoint and dismiss the city manager, and the current city manager was appointed behind closed door by five of the current uh, running uh, city uh, uh, candidates for city council. And they went and they were found uh, by the attorney general uh, of Massachusetts to have broken the open meeting law, uh, and they were. Uh, uh, they should have remedied that judgment, but decided to just go along and stay with the city manager that they had chosen, which was uh, Richard Rossi, and he was at the time the vice city manager and had served on the, uh, uh, the city as a vice city manager for uh, 30 years or so. So we had continuity. Well, what really happens is that uh, the way that uh, a corporate system uh, of this kind functions is that the uh, main way that we get uh, tax, uh, that we get revenue in the city is through commercial real estate taxes. So 75% of our revenue comes from commercial real estate taxes. And therefore, the, the main way and our main uh, my principal uh, source of revenue is going to be more development. And if we look at the future, and if we really want to have a future as bright uh, as we wish, then we have to look at development and more development and more development and we have to make sure that a good majority of that development is going to be uh, commercial uh, development and that means uh, office space, lab space, but also rental residential space because that's also considered uh, like uh, any rental uh, property is considered like commercial uh, uh, real estate revenue. So, with that in mind, the city manager is going to have a pride as the uh, CEO of the company, is also the person who appoints all the head of departments and all the people who are going to sit on the different boards. So you can imagine that the powers of the city manager are quite wide and far-reaching. And uh, basically he can uh, decide to do whatever he wants and if he doesn't uh, want to do a project or something that the community is asking for or that the city council is asking for, he can simply say as an excuse, well if you want me to do that then I have to raise your residential taxes because we also have in uh, Cambridge the lowest residential uh, residential taxes uh, in Massachusetts we are uh, we have uh, we are doing extremely well uh, financially so we could give kudos uh, to both uh, Bob Healy for have uh, brought us here and for Rich Rossi for have continuing uh, the uh, trend that uh, that was uh, that was uh, delegated to him uh, by Bob Healy well 
What happened though is that uh, the 180 million of free cash that we have and the AAA that, uh, bond rating that we have has come at a very high cost and that's a social cost. And that cost has to be actually is a, the, on the shoulders of not only of the uh, uh, city manager but also of the format of our government plan E and the weak city council that ensue from that uh, form of government. So we have uh, a city manager who is only accountable uh, to a city council so the city council is elected by, by us, but is actually a very weak uh, city council can't, which can't do anything because it doesn't hold uh, the power of the string. Although it does vote uh, yearly on the, the budget, it could affect in a certain way uh, the way the budget would go. In general, it's still in the hands of the city manager and there would have to be a substantially good reason to change uh, what is proposed by the city manager and usually that the, doesn't happen. So again, we have, oops, what happened here? Oh, well, I switched to uh, see those new TVs. There, I'm back. Uh, we have a new setup here at CCTV with all the swipe screen to show us uh, a different uh, p possible view of ourselves. It's uh, pretty fancy and fun. I might show you some at the end. Let me keep on going though. So I was uh, talking about uh, the city manager being in uh, uh, total control, pushing for revenue, having a weak city council, which although it wanted or if it wanted to accomplish anything, would still find itself in the tough position to have uh, of having to actually agree that the city manager raise residential taxes in order to uh, actually pay for a part of the development uh, that is going on right now, so that we could minim we, we could actually uh, scale down a little bit the pace at which we grow the commercial development and maybe try to, uh, to, to use the uh, uh, residential taxes uh, increase to compensate for that. Yes, I'm saying that. I'm talking about tax, right, tax raise, for example, for all the properties that are worth uh, $1 million or more. Are we actually in the People's Republic of Cambridge or are we in the Corporate Republic of Cambridge like it seems to be the case? So the uh, form of government also makes the community engagement and the voice of the people when they participate uh, or they try to participate uh, and have their voice heard uh, in the processes, what happened is that they don't get heard because actually the prime directive of actually generating the revenue is always more important than any of what the community or any of the impact that uh, that revenue is going to have uh, on this city. And over the last three to five years, this impact has been felt significantly. It was coming and has been coming for a while now, but really over the last three to five years, it has really uh, uh, come out uh, in a very, very strong way. And what exactly does it, uh, how has it manifest itself? Well, it has manifested itself through the uh, displacement of people who have lived here for a very long time, generation to generation, and whose children cannot afford actually to come back and live in Cambridge. Through the fact that uh, our uh, law, law for, uh, although that we, we are doing well uh, in, with respect to other cities in terms of affordable housing, we are still in a huge crisis regarding the, affordable, uh, the affordability of housing in uh, Cambridge. Uh, a minimum rent uh, is, uh, we're talking about here uh, in uh, uh, affordable rent uh, talking about two or three thousand dollars which is crazy uh, totally crazy when we uh, look at the realities uh, around us so we have a dire uh, crisis of affordable housing we have a dire tech, uh, crisis of displacement and we have a form of government which doesn't allow us to actually do what is necessary to make sure that we actually take a path that is going to bring us some resolution on those uh, issues, where we can actually bring ourselves and get together and together find a solution that is going to have an impact and make a difference over the long term. That we can actually come together so that we can elect, for example, a directly uh, a mayor that would actually carry that vision uh, with uh, the political leverage that we would give him uh, as an electorate. So, I'm going to come back again to the reason why uh, the city manager form of government is not one in which the community can really participate and the main reason why we can't participate is because we still have the uh, revenue as the prime directive and the city manager is always going to decide on the side of revenue versus uh, the side of the social uh, cost because that's his job, he's not elected, his job is to bring revenue and to make Cambridge as financially viable and positive and, and, and well as possible and 
to, uh, to that uh, goal, he has done a very go good job. The problem is that currently it's not a city manager that we need, it's a directly elected mayor that is going to take into consideration the social impact of what we are trying to achieve economically. So that being said, what can we do? Well, we basically can actually change the way we govern ourselves. We can go from plan E to plan B. We have this opportunity, we have uh, this opportunity all the time, but at this particular time, there are many factors that have come together that they make this time a particularly good one. We are financially in a good place. It is the end of the contract of the current city manager. And instead of investing tons and tons of money in trying to get, create a process and to find another city manager, we should invest that time and money in actually changing the way we govern ourselves. It would result in us having to create a discussion citywide uh, around a certain number of topics to actually define what we want from our local democracy, democracy and what are the means and methods that we want uh, in order to achieve those expectations. And I believe that there are five fundamental factors on which uh, this discussion should occur. The first one is transparency and accountability. And by transparency, I mean clarity and simplicity of processes. And what that really uh, tends to is to say that we really want to make sure that we understand where a pro uh, process has been and where it's going so that we can make sure that when we try to engage ourselves and make our voice heard, we can do it in an efficient way and with the goal of actually influencing uh, the final decision that is going to be made. Not for the simple pur purpose of actually standing up and saying something. The second reason for, the second part of transparency and the idea of simplicity and clarity that is represented by transparency is that it's going to make the people who are in charge of the processes accountable for those processes. So when we have simple and clear processes, then we can have the people who are in charge of them accountable uh, to us for running those, proper, those processes and their ultimate results. Currently, what we have are complex legal, uh, uh, legalese that stand in the way of us completely understanding what is going on and the way that we can influence what is going on. And in order to get a mastery of that legalese, you either have to be an attorney speci specialized in uh, this type of law, or you have to hire that expertise in order to uh, uncover and make sure that the people who are in charge of the processes are accountable. Well, currently, we don't have either of those. So uh, one of the big reasons that we don't have e e either of those is because it is better for our form of government to actually create the illusion of participation and of a democratic process so that once we see that kind of illusion happening, we are distracted from the real thing that is happening, which is actually the way that our city is governed in the hand of one individual, the CEO and city manager, and that just goes through the step that are required by law without actually having to respect what the outcome of uh, these processes uh, are. So, we have transparency and accountability, which are the first fundamental pillar. The second one is term limits. And this one is actually uh, the one that most of the time uh, gets people crazy because they always come to me and say, but look, we are in the greatest democracy of them all. We are in the United States of America. This is where democracy is happening. Well, the real issue here is that the numbers are very different from the reality that wants to be that uh, the idea that the voter is the term limit is uh, trying to project. The voters are not the term limits, and we have to come to terms with the fact and not actually live under the illusion that because we say so, it is so. 95% of the time that a politician seeks re-election, be it at the state, federal, at the federal, state, or local level, they get re-elected. We all know it. It's not a, a mystery or it's not a hidden secret. We actually know it. Whenever I talk to someone and I say that, everybody totally agrees because we are aware that it is the obvious uh, reality. So let's not deny it. And actually, in order to make it better, the term limits are a good methodology, a good uh, middle point in order to really achieve uh, the engagement and the participation that we are trying to uh, to achieve in a real democracy. And 
the term limits the real the, the real two things that are that are really fundamentally essential uh, to term limits the first one is what i like to call the kind of the bad apple uh, syndrome that one politician that uh, you don't like and that has a constituency and that keeps on getting elected over and over and over again because they have that constituency. I think it sounds really familiar for anyone who has been interested in Cambridge uh, politics. Always the same people getting elected over and over and over again. And you're like, okay, well, there's really nothing I can do about this. That politician has its constituency and he's going to keep on getting elected and my voice has, doesn't matter, I'm just going to pull out. And once that person has decided that they're going to pull out, that's it. They're not only out of uh, the elections, uh, the, uh, the election themselves, they are out of uh, the idea that they would get engaged uh, in the local uh, decision-making processes. And so it's a real negative and a real negative way on why people are not engaged. So term limits is a very important factor in figuring out that we actually, it keeps people into the game. So what happens if you have, for example, four terms of two years for a city councilor? That means that it could serve a total of eight years. And after eight years, we would see that person gone. And if it wasn't a person that was uh, on our side of the issues, then we would have at the end of that, those eight years, the opportunity to bring someone new that would be more inclined to be uh, in the side on, on the side of our uh, ideas and, and belief. The, henceforth, basically the idea of term limits, in an, it's an idea that allows for more engagement. It makes people bring them back into the process. That's why at the presidential election, we get a much better turnout, and it's not very, that good. And, but the main reason is because we have that turnaround where we can actually see that over a certain amount of years, we always have a shift in who is going to be uh, at the presidency. Well, it should happen at every level of power, especially uh, at the local level, because the more people are familiar with the processes and how we are governed, the better it is for us us, not the less person, this person. The reason also we want term limits and how, say, how engagement is signified is that if we have again eight years of term limits over a period of 20 years, then we have actually three people who are serving. Instead of one individual who's going to end up serving 20 years, become professionals and actually start serving their own interests versus the interests of the people that have elected them. So term limits, there is no argument, I think, is an obvious thing that we need to do in order for us to establish uh, something that would resemble uh, a democracy. The directly elected mayor is the third one and obviously at the heart of everything. And in a city of the size of Cambridge, it is kind of unconscionable that we don't have uh, a directly elected mayor. The directly elected mayor is not only for the actual uh, accountability of the decision maker, but on top of that, it is also so that we can actually have a vision for our city. So we can decide when we vote, where we are going, how we are going to get there, and we can choose the person that we think has the best plan and the best vision for the city and go along and rally behind that one individual and offer him a political leverage to be able to negotiate with developers with every interest on behalf of uh, the people of Cambridge. This is not the case currently. It simply isn't the case currently. So right now we have a very uh, reactive form of government. We have a very deep uh, hole in terms of leadership. It is not the role of the city manager to be uh, a social uh, uh, or political leader. He is the CEO. He's a business person. And basically uh, the idea that we can actually shift personnel and uh, have a very different outcome is kind of a, an idea that's a little bit ludicrous. We have to actually change our system and change the format of our government to really actually change the way that we are going to uh, govern ourselves. And the directly elected mayor is the only way to go. Now we have the fourth one, which is the publicly financed campaign. And the publicly financed campaign is also extremely important because it's about the 99% uh, the, the, the publicly financed campaign we have to be able to actually start uh, campaigning or decide that we're going to participate in our local government the first one after one of those first steps that we want to share our idea we want to know if they're going to resonate with people around us and if they do they should actually be represented uh, at our uh, local uh, level 
and therefore the more people we engage the more we can have the more ideas we have the better the solution that we're going to end up with is going to be at least if they're well synthesized and if we offer ourselves the mechanics that are, are, are going to allow us to do that. And for sure, right now, the mechanics that are in front of us serves, do, doesn't, don't serve that particular purpose. So the publicly financed campaign is about the 99% and about the equity, about everybody being able uh, to participate. But not only that, considering that we have a yearly budget in Cambridge of $550 million, that we do elections every two years, and that over that two-year period, that means that we have a budget of $1.1 billion. If we were to spend $4 million every two years on publicly financed campaign, we could actually finance 80 candidates. Because on average right now, and that would be for very, very expensive election, because right now, this is the average cost of a, a, a city council election if you are if you want to be elected so if you want to were to look at the number you would see that those people who have raised 45 fifty thousand dollars have the most chance of uh, 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 getting elected so basically it, the idea is also that all that money and most of it comes from corporate interest and if it doesn't come from corporate interest it comes from people who want to have influence it's the be the best we can do right now is actually like many, uh, like a good part of the challenger is to not accept money from people who are going to be part of the decisions that we are going to make, outsiders, developer, commercial interests, and instead to take only money from residents and citizens of Cambridge or outside who are willing to actually root for us so we can achieve uh, our goal. But the reality is that if it was publicly financed campaign and we could have four million dollars that we invest in those campaigns every two years, we could finance 80 people to run for an election. That's a lot of people, many more people than we'd actually want to run. So we could definitely actually handle that cost. And in reality, it wouldn't be a cost. It would be truly an investment in the people of Cambridge and an investment in the ideal that is democracy. So publicly financed campaign are like term limits, one of those two fundamental pillars that we don't have to do because we want to, but we need to do because it's morally the right thing to do. And then we have the last one, which is non-cumulation of mandate, which to me is pretty natural. Actually, I don't think that we should state it, but really what it means is that you can only have one public job at a time. So currently, we have one of our city councillors, Tim Toomey, who is both a state representative for East Cambridge, East Somerville at the, at the state level, and then he is where he makes $60,000. And he's also a city councillor uh, in Cambridge where he makes $80,000. Well, I think that not only is it a conflict of interest because the state doesn't always have the interest of the city and vice versa. And when the, uh, uh, there is conflict, to me, is not going to be the person where the state is going to come to, to try to find some, uh, some help. And if they do, then that means that he'll be on the other side and not on the side of the city, an obvious conflict of interest. So definitely, we can say that it's a bad idea, naturally, not to have two public jobs at the same time. You can have two jobs, not two public jobs at the same time. It's also about engagement, two public jobs, two people. So I'm going to uh, wrap it up uh, uh, now. Uh, I have to actually uh, cut my show a little short today because uh, I have to go uh, to a debate uh, in Porter Square. But I wanted to make sure tonight that I came clearly with uh, my uh, platform for the election on November 3rd for the city council. I'm hoping that uh, a lot of people are watching, although I know it might not be the case. And I want you to know that I'm doing this as a no donation, no spending campaign. And I'm doing this for one simple reason. It's because if what I say doesn't resonate with you, then there is no point in me thinking that I can change it by myself. I am not an idiot and I don't think that it would be reasonable of me to think that I can do this by myself. This needs your participation and your engagement and your will to actually see a new kind of local government in Cambridge and to use the means that we have both financial, humane and intellectual in Cambridge to actually create this new form of government which could become a beacon of democracy versus be being what it is right now, which is its darkest secret. We need to change how, how Cambridge is done so that we are responsible for the decisions that are being made. 
And I really want you to take that into consideration when you go vote on November 3rd and for all the people that you're actually voting for. And I want, you to remind, I want to remind you that a lot of people of the unity state or the so-called unity states have been at the city council for many, 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 many years. And they have not been able or have not anticipated or taken the necessary step to actually find solutions for the, for the, for the crisis that we currently have in terms of affordable housing and of displacement. So they have a certain amount of responsibility. And during this election, it's a time where you can make them accountable for that responsibility. So once again, I'm letting you know that I am running for city council, that I am seeking your number one vote, that I'm urging you to make sure that you consider all the other candidates who are challengers uh, in this election, that we vote an establishment that has gone sour, and that we actually create a new democracy in Cambridge based on transparency and accountability, term limits, an obviously and importantly, an importantly directly elected mayor, publicly financed campaign, and not non-cumulation of mandate, one public job at a time. My name is Ilan Levy, and I'm looking forward to serving as your city councillor and helping make the change that we desperately need. Thank you.